anyway, I'm delighted to be asked to come along and uh, give you some education. And I thought, how could I best be of value to you? So I thought I would give you um, some information uh, pertaining to the thyroid that's very relevant uh, to the final FRCS exam. So really the aims of this uh, session are to enhance your clinical acumen um, by improving your assessment skills, uh, your investigation choices that you make uh, when you uh, manage a thorough patient, uh, and also enhance your management knowledge. And I've always found that the number of investigations tends to be proportional to litigation concern uh, and certainly um, uh, litigation aver uh, aversion or avoidance um, uh, and particularly the latter is, is, is a great reason in my experience for people over investigating and it's also inversely proportional to experience knowledge and acumen. Uh, when I was a medical student in the last century I always remember we used to do something called bedside teaching you know as, as Allaby principles of William Osler in Oxford and the consultant would always ask uh, the medical students what investigations they would request and if I was ever asked uh, what investigations I, I would consider are appropriate I would always say a full blood count at U and E not because I had any reason as to why it would be useful but it just seemed to be a sensible thing to do. Um, when I was a medical student, we didn't even have CT scanning. Uh, the CT scanner, uh, the first one was delivered uh, halfway through my medical school training and we didn't, certainly didn't have an MRI scan and ultrasonography was pretty much in a rudimentary uh, phase. We didn't really have fine needle aspirates uh, as well. So because of the ease of access for many of these investigations, uh, it, it's why people tend to use investigations as the first modality of choice and particularly the what I call the just in case scan. Um, just in case what exactly, which is probably the main uh, reason uh, or route that thyroid cancer is now um, diagnosed. So I want you to give some sort of thought as to what investigation choices you make. And this is a great relevance, of course, uh, to the fellowship because it's all about, obviously, you avoiding being stung by the so-called examiners. So where, where better to start than right at the beginning um, with some embryology? And the embryology is very relevant to thyroid and particularly parathyroid surgery. And in the primitive uh, embryo in the first six weeks of life, we have the floor of the mouth which is developed from the first branchial arch structures. And then you have these two uh, lateral uh, lingual swellings separated by a tuberculum impar. And posterior to the tuberculum impar is a foramen called the foramen cecum. Now we've got three uh, foramen cecums, one in the abdomen, but there's also one in the anterior skull base. It's a misconception that the thyroid develops from this condensation of mesenderm called the tuberculum impar. It is not derived from that. It's derived from the epithelium or the cells of the foramen cecum, which separates the first arch and ultimately the third arch structures because the second arch uh, gets squeezed out by proliferation of the exterm. In the, in the third branchial arch, which of course is supplied by the glossopharyngeal nerve. So it's the circumvallate papillae, not the terminal sulcus, which defines and uh, differentiates the anterior two thirds from the posterior third. So the thyroid doesn't in fact develop from the tongue base, uh, for reasons I've now made clear. And we know that within the first six weeks of life, it descends um, down uh, into the inferior aspect of the neck. It's very much uh, associated with the higher bone, which has second and third branchial arch derivation. Uh, and that's very important when we consider uh, doing the cyst trunks operation. And as it descends, it can leave cells along this tract, um, and that's the pathogenesis of the so-called thyroglossal 
duct cyst. As it descends, it's also uh, associated with proliferation of areas of the third and the fourth branchial pouches. And the dorsal portion of the third goes to form the inferior parathyroid gland and the ventral portion, the thymus. So the inferior parathyroid gland is always closely associated with the thymus in the so-called thyrothymic tract. And that's where you need to look for it when you do thyroid surgery or parathyroid surgery if you're looking for an abnormal. The fourth arch, the dorsal portion, forms the superior parathyroid gland. And that is associated with a proliferation of cells from the ventral pouch and also from the rudimentary fifth branchial arch. And it forms the ultimate branchial body. And the cells from the ultimate branchial body are populated from the neural crest and they go to form the calcitonin C cells. So the C cells therefore tend to be concentrated in the upper pole where the superior parathyroid gland lies. In MEN, you have a multifocal pathology, but sporadic MTC, a nodule in the upper lobe, they tend to occur more commonly with that type of pathology. And you'll see that in embryogenesis, um, once again, the superior parathyroid gland, which is from the fourth pouch, is very close to the upper pole. And as I've already mentioned, the inferior parathyroid gland with the thymus tends to descend into an anteromedial position. The recurrent laryngeal nerve, which is the six arch nerve, separates these two parathyroid glands. So the inferior gland is always anteromedial to it, whereas the superior gland is deep and posterior. So identifying the recurrent laryngeal nerve is very important if you're doing parathyroid surgery in knowing which parathyroid you've identified because with an adenoma, sometimes the superior parathyroid gland can be more inferiorly positioned when compared to the inferior gland because of the way to the adenoma. If you found the superior gland, there's actually little point in trying to identify an inferior gland, retropharyngeal, retrosophical, that's not where it will be. It will be in the anteromedial area. Because it's third arch, however, it can sometimes appear in the clotted sheath. So if you're looking for a third arch gland, those are the sort of areas where you would try and look. So it just gives an example of how embryology is important in terms of your clinical decision making and the practice of surgery, or the art of surgery, uh, when performing thyroid and parathyroid surgery. And again, this um, reiterates the neural crest cells uh, populate the ultimate branchial body, which goes to form the calcitonin C cells. In the primitive embryo, there is a ventral and a dorsal primitive aorta, and they're connected by intersegmental vessels. And the proliferation uh, or disappearance of various intersegmental vessels go to form the, the vessels within the, the head and neck. And there are two aortic arches. There's a right and left in the early embryo. And the fourth arch, which forms the arch the aorta, is connected to the sixth arch artery, which is the pulmonary artery, by the ductus arteriosus. And as you know, this closes off at birth, it forms a ligamentum arteriosum, and therefore the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which I've already mentioned to you, is the six arch nerve, that hooks underneath the ligamentum arteriosum, is therefore fixed within the chest, and then gradually ascends in the tracheoesophageal groove. On the right side, the intersegmental vessels disappear. So on the right side, the recurrent laryngeal nerve hooks under the subclavian artery, which is the fourth arch artery on the right hand side. And therefore it has a more oblique uh, course. This has relevance because occasionally the right 
uh, subclavian comes off the aortic arch on the left hand side and can lead to symptoms such as dysphagia, dysphagia in the sorea, can go in between the trachea and esophagus in front of the trachea or even behind the actual esophagus itself. And it means therefore that there is no lower break of cephalic artery for the recurrent laryngeal nerve to hook up. So when you're doing thyroid surgery, you'll be looking for the nerve down here, when in fact it's going to be coming higher up and more horizontally. Okay, so if you're having trouble, it's always going on the right side, there's an instance of about 1%, then you have to think, oh, perhaps there's a non-recurrent recurrent laryngeal nerve, which will be on the right side, unless the patient happens to have situs inversus. So you may have something like this in the exam, and there are some pathologies that are a spot diagnosis. So we know that it's thyroid rather than the lymph node because the thyroid is attached to the trachea by the condensation of fascia called Berry's ligament. And the thyroglossal duct and tract is also attached to the tongue base and to the thyroid. And so when the patient protrudes their tongue, the pathology moves up. So that's the thyroglossal duct cyst. So then you may be asked, well, what investigations would you request? If you're considering doing thyroid surgery, it is, it is a sine qua non that they should have a thyroid function test. So do request the thyroid function. And then the question is, what sort of radiologic investigation would you request and why? You could perhaps request an ultrasound scan, which is non-invasive, a technetium scan, which is radiation. You could do both or none because it's a clinical diagnosis. The reason for doing uh, an investigation of a radiological nature is just to make sure that it's not their own thyroid tissue because that's important with regard to the informed consent. It doesn't alter the management. They're still going to have a cystrunch operation. But request an ultrasound scan. It tells you something about the nature of the thyroid loss duct cyst. Because it's thyroid tissue, it may not necessarily be benign. It could be a, a papillary thyroid cancer, for instance. And the ultrasound scan will tell you the characteristics of the thyroid loss duct cyst. So I think an ultrasound scan is perhaps the investigation of choice. I used to request a technician scan. I don't think it's necessary now. I think an ultrasound scan is sufficient. But saying an ultrasound scan and a technician scan, you know, justifiably, you know, wouldn't be marked then as erroneous. This was a very nice Iranian lady. I think she was in her early 70s. And I uh, treated her probably about 10 years ago now. And she told me that at the age of about 14, she had some form of thyroid surgery. So you can see a scar there. And she presented with this swelling in the submandibular area, this swelling she'd had for some time. It didn't really bother her. But what really bothered her is that she started to complain of dysphagia. And when I did an examination in the area of the tongue base, I had tissue that macroscopically looked like thyroid tissue. So this was an example of someone who had lingual thyroid, and lingual thyroids are obviously rare, um, but because it's thyroid tissue, it can be associated with any pathology that the thyroid's going to develop any, anyway. So it could have a multinodular goiter or cancer or even thyrotoxicosis. And this lady essentially coming from Iran where a multinodular goiter is endogenous, developed a multinodular goiter within the, the lingual thyroid. And without going into too much detail, I did a lip spitting approach, removed it, and a temporary tracheostomy. And when I did the tracheostomy, what was very interesting, you could see obviously no thyroid because it was a lingual thyroid, but you saw the parathyroids just sitting, you know, next to trachea. 
as evidence that they have a different embryological origin. So with a lingual thyroid, um, an ectopic thyroid, they are lingering about 90% and about 30% of patients are hypothyroid. And dysphagia, bleeding from trauma are, are common symptoms. And it may present in pregnancy because in pregnancy, the thyroid naturally enlarges physiologically. So the examiner may ask you, what radiologic investi investigations would you request? Uh, would you request an ultrasound, a technician, or some cross-section imaging in the form of an MRI or CT? And I think you could make a case for requesting all three. Again, an ultrasound scan, because it tells you something about the nature of the thyroid swelling. Is it a cancer? Is it a multinodular goiter? Are all the nodules looking benign? A technician scan obviously would make the diagnosis because technician is taken up by the follicular cell in much the same way as I do. So you'd see no uptake in the lower neck because there's, there's, there's uh, no normal thyroid and you'd see some uptake obviously within the, the tongue base and the neck provided it was at least still functioning. In this particular instance you'd also want some cross-sectional imaging either MRI or CT if you're planning surgery. I prefer CT because the thyroid is rich in iodine. Often you don't need to do contrast, but it shows up very well on CT scanning and it gives you a nice sort of contrast between thyroid and, and, and the muscle of the tongue. So what about thyroid nodules? Well, we know they're very common about one in 20 of us have palpable nodules and clinical investigation increases this considerably and we know that if we look at all the nodules within the thyroid at autopsy about one in 20 of those will be malignant and if you look even further at autopsy thyroids about a third of thyroids will have breasts of malignant cells it's almost like a biological phenomenon like the prostate so patients die with, with it, not because of it. And we know that thyroid cancer is increasing significantly at 7% per annum. And that's because of the just-in-case scan largely, an increase in the tendency to image rather to manage patients on clinical grounds. And the commonest type of patient that we'll see in ENT will be the typical globus type patient and the GP usually will request the just-in-case scan, which shows a thyroid nodule, and then that leads to the diagnosis and, and intervention. In North America, it's already the equivalent to oral and oropharyngeal uh, cancer combined. And in 2014, we had about 3,500 new cases reported. So very much uh, on the increase. So the problem that we have, uh, a nodule's being diagnosed and the patient's going to be worried, is it cancer? You're worried, is it cancer? And you need to confirm or refute that um, with the patient. And you know from what I've just said that biological cancer is common, um, but clinical cancer that's going to hurt the patient is relatively uncommon. So it's having that balance on, 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 on managing the patient. Life-threatening cancer is very uncommon, and we know that 81% of new cancers are two centimetres or less have very, very good uh, survival with low disease mortality. However, we know that microcarcinomas can kill people, and fatal cancers sometime in their life history would have been microcarcinomas. A microcarcinoma is, is uh, defined as a cancer less than 10 millimeters. And when we put it in the, in the context of other reasons for death, so if you've got thyroid cancer, you've got about a 13% chance of it killing you, which is roughly about the same as dying from food inhalation and alcohol overdose. But of those 13%, many of them are gonna be medullaries or anaplastic or cancer in elderly people. It very rarely kills people 
below the age of 55. It does, it can do, but rarely does. Those patients that have microcarcinoma, once again, those tumours uh, less than uh, 10 millimetres, we can usually define the ones that are going to be more aggressive. So they tend to be in the elderly male. There may be evidence of extrathyroidal extension. Um, and if you've got two of those risk factors present, then you've got a 92% risk of the patient dying. So you can really sort of stratify as to what you're going to do with these, these various patients. There is a case, and there was a paper by Ito from Japan, where he's followed up diagnosed microcarcinomas for seven years or more. And this is a cohort of patients that are in the order of 350. And only one or two developed lymph nodes, and there hasn't been a death in any of them. So sometimes conservative management in the algae where they've got other comorbidities is a, an absolute um, reasonable way of managing these patients. Um, and we've also got to take into consideration one of the treatment complications. So uh, surgery has a 6% incidence of complications, uh, total thyroidectomy, 6.5% risk of permanent hypercalcemia. That was from the fifth beats audit. Um, and looking at the, the HES data, um, I've been involved with the Get It Right First Time uh, study. And I nearly fell off my chair when I found out that in England, because that's the HES data, that over a 12 month period, those patients that have a total thyroidectomy they have a 1.4% chance of either sustaining a temporary or a permanent tracheostomy. Huge. Radioiodine also has problems such as salivary gland and taste disturbances, the risk of increased uh, cancer, particularly within the salivary gland, and a six-fold increase in leukemia. So these are all, uh, you know, surgery radio, they're all, they're all aspects of patient management that can possibly hurt the patient for a, a pathology where if we don't do anything at all, the patient's not going to come to harm. So that, that's another conundrum that we have. So what are the risk factors for cancer? Mm. Radiation is the single uh, external factor that has been shown to increase the incidence of cancer. So after the Chernobyl incident in the 80s, the incidence of thyroid cancer increased 20 to 30 fold in Belarus, Ukraine region. And the younger you are, even intrauterine, the more susceptible you are to the effects of radiation. So if you've had uh, patients present with a nodular thyroid or a thyroid pathology and they've, they've given, had a history of irradiation to the chest or neck, then you should be particularly alert to uh, underlying cancer development. And radiation increases the incidence of benign and cancerous thyroid nodules. And it also increases the risk of primary hyperparathyroidism. There are rare familial syndromes. If you're male, old, young, these are risk factors. If there's a history of rapid increase in size, history of previous thyroid cancer, so the local regional recurrence, these are going to be confounding factors. And if someone presents with lymph nodes and a thyroid swelling, also that should alert you to an underlying diagnosis of cancer. And the younger you are, the more likely you are to have lymph nodes. Evidence of local invasion, such as vocal cord paralysis, and just remember, it's absolutely imperative that even if the patient has a normal voice, that they have a vocal cord examination. Because a third of patients with a vocal cord palsy can have a near normal or normal voice. Very important to make that diagnosis. It's important in terms of the informed consent and how you're going to manage the patient, and particularly the discussion with the patient. More advanced tumours, you may get a uh, difference in swallowing. And the consistency of a thyroid cancer, it's hard. It's very much, it feels, feels uh, very much firmer than, than something that's soft, which is more likely to be indicative of a benign pathology. 
So these are the rare syndromes that can be associated with thyroid cancer. Um, you'll know about the MEN2 uh, cancers associated with medullary thyroid cancer, but rarely, rarely PTC can also have a familial uh, genetic predisposition. So in terms of the clinical assessment, uh, feel for the consistency. Ask yourself, can I get below the thyroid? Is it fixed? What's the vocal cord function? And the blood tests that you need to do are, of course, once again, thyroid function. You may want to do thyroid proxenase antibodies. It's not really that helpful clinically, but it tells you if they've got an underlying thyroiditis, then the case may be technically a little bit more sticky, more difficult to do. And that may come into how you manage your list, how many patients you decide to operate on that particular day. And of course, TSH receptor antibody, if you're thinking of a diagnosis of Graves, it's a very specific marker for Graves. Do not request routine thyroglobulin and calcitonin. It does not help you in the management of the patient. So thyroglobulin is a, is a glycoprotein. It's got a molecular weight of about 600,000 Daltons. It is a tumor marker, much like calcitonin, but they should not be part of your routine investigative armatory. Okay, let's, let's, your time to have a little bit of thought now. Um, so this is a clinical case of a 28 year old female that presented with a painless swelling here in the right thyroid lobe. No other symptoms. The goiter was smooth, it was soft. Lateral compartment examination, there were no nodes. So just think what sort of investigations that you would request. I would hope that an ultrasound scan would be the first um, radiological investigation that you think of. And of course, we do a thyroid function test. And an ultrasound scan and a thyroid function perhaps maybe the only things that you need to do at this stage. And if you find out that the thyroid function test is abnormal, if it's high, so the patient's thyrotoxic, then it may be that you don't want to do the ultrasound scan, you want to do a technician scan. So this would be a case of solitary toxic nodule, and this could be investigated by means of an ID one, two, three, or a, a technician scan. If you do an ultrasound scan first and you find there's a nodule there and you put a needle in, because the patient's thyrotoxic, it will come back as a follicular neoplasm. But there's no harm. And often that's the way it happens if the patient doesn't have symptoms, doesn't give you any pointers that they're thyrotoxic, but they may have an ultrasound scan finding a biopsy and then you request an isotope scan. So but you just have to interpret the cytology on the basis that this is a nodule, a hot nodule in a thyrotoxic patient, and we know that hot nodules are not malignant. In terms of the management, um, surgery or radioiodine, I would recommend surgery for the simple reason that if you remove half the thyroid gland, the patient's got an 80% chance of not becoming hypothyroid. Whereas if they have radioiodine, they have a 100% chance of becoming hypothyroid and ends up on thyroxine. And that tends to be earlier rather than later. It will certainly occur within 10 years and it usually occurs within the first three years. So I think that's a good driver for recommending surgery. Another 28-year-old female, losing weight, palpitations, clinically thyrotoxic, smooth bilateral goiter. You can actually see it, can't you, very clearly. No thrills or bruises. What investigations would you request? So you know this patient's thyrotoxic, you're going to obviously request a thyroid function, but you're not going to request an ultrasound scan. It is an isotope scan that you need to request. Okay, so iodine and technician scan, which will show uniform, avid uptake of tracing. 
and as I mentioned before, the trap antibodies very specific for Graves' disease and three causes of thyrotoxicosis. You've got the toxic autonomous nodule, which was case one. This is a case of Graves' disease. And there's also thyrotoxicosis associated with nodules throughout the thyroid. So toxicosis and the multinodulability, which is plums. So the treatment, uh, it can be medical, it can be radio iodine or surgery. And it depends on another number of factors. So if patient presents with really bad thyroid eye disease and a massive thyroid, that is not going to settle on medical treatment. It's surgery. If it's a small thyroid, no thyroid eye disease, we would start them on medical treatment first, 12 months, withdrawal, medical treatment. And if there's a relapse, which occurs in approximately 50% of patients, then I think radio ID or surgery would both be reasonable options. And we discussed that with the patient. Um, many of the Graves patients are young females. They have families and having radio ID does cause problems for them socially in, in terms of distancing with their children, which they don't like. So what about this case? You can make the diagnosis by just looking at it. This is a huge multinodular goiter. You can actually see the very large nodules. And it's very obvious looking at this patient that you cannot get below the thyroid. And you need to know how far is this going into the chest. So you need to request some cross-sectional imaging. My preference, again, is for CT scanning. You've got to be a little bit careful with the contrast because associated with this, um, they often have a degree of subclinical or even uh, clinical toxicosis. And if you give them contrast, there's about 20 grams of iodine in the contrast. So they, they can become temporarily thyrotoxic or more thyrotoxic. And these are elderly patients that often have atrial fibrillation and maybe other cardiovascular comorbidities and that's called uh, the Job based no phenomenon. Again it is absolutely obvious that uh, this patient has a large multinodular goiter. You examine the patient, you ask yourself can I get below it? This is going to be treated by surgery because radio iodine is not going to shrink that away. The patient's concerned about it cosmetically. The patient's having dysphonia, dysphagia. So that is going to be uh, managed by a total thyroidectomy. So there's actually no point doing an ultrasound scan either. So thyroid function tests, surgery are the only investigations you need to do for that type of scenario. So again, just think about your decision making. What am I asking from the test rather than just saying, right, everyone's going to have an ultrasound scan, everyone's going to have a CT scan. Think deeply about the requests that you're going to make because all investigations have unforeseen circumstances, the law of unforeseen circumstances. And you if I scan myself, almost certainly I'd find things to do. So what we request has potential morbidity as well as mortality. It's very common for patients to go to a doctor about a completely different thing and then the investigation takes them down a different route. And the original presenting complaint seems to get completely forgotten. So going on to the ultrasound scan, and this is the radiological modality of first choice when requesting an investigation on the thyroid. So occasionally uh, you'll be asked to see a patient um, because they've had a CT or an MRI and notice of a goiter. They may have had a PET scan and the PET scan may light up in the thyroid and just be aware of that. So if you've got a, a strongly positive lobe on PET imaging and a nodule is responsible for that, it has at least a 30% chance of being malignant. Okay, and that can be primary or can be a secondary 
from other sources such as the breast or the lung. So even uh, if you've got the PET scan, you still have to request an ultrasound scan and a fine needle biopsy. And an ultrasound scan is one of those investigations which is very operator dependent. So it needs to be done by a radiologist that's an expert in fire and ultrasound scanning. And the radiologist can tell a great deal about the underlying nature of the module. And there are certain features in particular that are quite specific for the diagnosis of thyroid cancer. So microcalcification, hypoechogenicity compared to the surrounding background thyroid, is there any intranodular vascularity compared to peripheral vascularity? The latter is more likely to be indicative of benign pathology. Is it solid rather than being cystic? Solid more likely to be cancer. Does it have irregular and ill-defined margins? Again, more indicative of cancer. And if it's taller than wider also, that is quite a, a worrying feature. So as you can see, these are the ultrasound features. Uh, and these show the various specificities. So microcalcification, hypoechogenicity, taller than wider, those three aspects in particular are quite specific for the diagnosis of thyroid cancer and the, the things that you need to be aware of and, and pick up on on an ultrasound report. In terms of the cytology, which is our gold standard uh, for making a diagnosis, and I want to iterate also that it's very important that you go away understanding that thyroid cancer, to all intents and purposes, is a preoperative, not a postoperative diagnosis. Okay, looking at the ultrasound, fine needle biopsy, the presenting features, this should all allow you to pull together and make up a clinical picture about what the likelihood is of the pathology being cancer. And just like ultrasonography, cytology can vary, again, depending on the expertise of the cytopathologist. So in 2002, the British Thyroid Association did up the thigh classification. And very roughly, these are the risk of malignancies for the threes, fours, and fives. But note how common errors are, and these errors can significantly alter the management of patients. So it's really, really important, therefore, that the cytopathologist that's reviewing them has particular expertise in this area. And it's very common at our multidisciplinary team meeting that the cytology from other centres is often changed when you've got someone with greater expertise looking at it. So it avoids a lot of unnecessary surgery, so the 5 3 f at a peripheral or another centre may well be downgraded to a 5 2 which is benign and therefore may not need surgery. So that is more a more common scenario than the benign being upgraded to a follicular neoplasm. And the sort of features that you see are these intranuclear inclusions, um, so-called Samona bodies. Uh, the, nuclear, uh, the nuclei can be grooved, overlapping, and there's a lot of pleomorphism. Um, whereas with medullary, you often have this granular cytoplasm, large, hyperdense nuclei, and of course, it stains the calcitonin and, and, and amyloid too. So I mentioned earlier, don't do a routine thyroglobulin or calcitonin. So the normal baseline calcitonin is 15 to 20, but there are lots of reasons as to why the calcitonin can be in a worrying uh, range, such as um, kidney problems or lung disease. So it's not a very specific marker um, of um, medullary thyroid cancer. So if you do a basal coast calcitonin test, and the result comes back as over 100, that patient has medullary thyroid cancer. End of story. But nodular thyroid disease can also lead to a raise, calcitonin, and the problem is if you get a result, something in that order. 
repeat it, and if it's elevated, then you can do something called a pentagastrin stimulation to avoid false positives. And if that goes to greater than 100 picograms per mil, which is more than three times upper limit, then again, you've got a diagnosis of medullary heart cancer. So the Americans um, have a different system. They have the Bethesda system, which was developed in 2009, um, which is very similar in many respects to our system. Um, the risk of malignancy, as you can see, is shown in the column here. And the great problem that we have is here, the three A's and the, 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 the five, three F's. And this is where the molecular panels that have been developed um, in America um, may have value. Um, they don't really have any use for 5-4 or 5-5 because those patients are going to be operated on anyway. But it's those that are in these categories that have a risk of lynx of around about 25%. So looking at a different way, about three and four of those patients have a necessary diagnostic surgery. So if we had a molecular panel that could genetically profile the cells within the module, then that may allow us to advise no surgery and discharge the patient. Or the other uh, factor, it may be uh, showing the molecular profile, which is very much uh, in keeping with the cancer. And then rather than lobectomy, it may mean a rule in where we're doing a total thyroidectomy and managing in a different way rather than do a diagnostic hemithyroidectomy, make the diagnosis, and then second stage have a completion thyroidectomy. So it possibly has some value in, in, in that respect. The great problem is they're very expensive. And even if we have them, it's very important that you validate the results from the molecular panel with your local institution cytology. And this is essentially what it's, what it's based on. Um, the Cancer Genome Atlas was published in 2014, and they used uh, whole exon sequencing by Fish uh, method. And we know that RET mutations are, are very common with thyroid cancer, uh, papillary, and MTC. And BRAF also is, is, is quite a common uh, mutation seen in papillary thyroid cancer. Um, the new uh, sequence tests um, look at a whole array and they've been reported to have a negative uh, predictive values, as you can see, which essentially means if you've got a test uh, that has a negative uh, predictive value of 95%, it's only got a 5% chance of being malignant. And conventionally, that, that's accepted as reasonable grounds for following the patient up and manage them in a conservative way, very much like benign pathology. So the take home points, um, we've really got to educate uh, primary care to stop doing the just in case um, for non-specific symptoms. Uh, as I said earlier, it is the, the main route that we're diagnosing thyroid cancer and it's leading to a lot of uh, thyroid surgery and probably has little bearing into the outcome because thyroid cancer in the young has an excellent prognosis. It's very much like prostate. So in the States, they were screening uh, men with PSA, and this was leading to 30,000 robotic assisted prostatectomies annually. Uh, many of those patients would become impotent or incontinent, and then there's the healthcare resource issues that are attached to that as well. And when they looked as to whether their screening program actually led to an increase um, in survival. It did it save more lives? They found that it made no difference whatsoever. So PSA screening certainly is controversial and so would ultrasonography screening of the neck and it would be the wrong thing to do for our healthcare uh, system and for patients. So an ultrasound scan is a primary modality, um, single, or multiple non-suspicious nodules less than one centimeter require no investigation. Um, but nodules greater than five millimeters with features of cancer 
and then you can do a fine needle biopsy. And you can do a fine needle biopsy for solitary nodules that are 10 millimeters or more that are solid or greater than two centimeters if they're cystic stroke solid because occasionally cancers um, can be a combination of the two regardless of the risk factors ever seen on ultrasound scanning. Okay, so that's that's my bit over. So I wonder what you've learned. So um, I thought we, we could do a quiz. And um, so I've got a, a range of questions for you to, to answer. Uh, and then we can have a more of an interactive session at the end. So, uh, so the first question, uh, recurrence following cyst trunks procedure. So it's very important that you know who Sistrunk was. He, he was an American surgeon in 1918 that described the technique for removing the thyroglossal duct cyst, where you remove the cyst and also the central portion of the hyoid bone because of its embryological um, approximation. And the cyst isn't a defined sphere. It's got a Christmas tree sort of... Uh, pseudopodium podium that emanate from it. So it's very important that you do a wide local excision of the pathology, taking a little bit of strap muscle, as well as once again, the central portion of the high bone. But there is always going to be recurrence following the cystrunks procedure. So what is it? Five, 15, 25% or 10? You either know it or you don't, so that's enough time. Let's move on. Prof, um, Next question. to share the results of each question as you go, I'm, I'm not sure otherwise do that? it will work going back to it. I don't, uh, I don't want to lose all the answers, sorry. Do I, um, do I stop sharing I, now? I can share the results. So I, I need to stop sharing, don't I? No, everyone can see the poll. Um, they've all responded. Just wondered if you wanted to go through the answers e at each uh, well, question. I, I, I can't see the poll. So, um, oh, there we are. Okay, so most of you said 5%, uh, which is wrong. Um, so traditionally, it's about 15%. So a quarter of you were right. So I, d I don't think they'd mark you down terribly if you said 10%, um, but 15% but, but is, is what's quoted. Okay, so next question, Anna. Hypothyroidism is seen in what percentage of ectopic thyroid glands? 10, 30, 75, or five. Okay, done. Let's see the. Oh, I think I told you that in one of the slides, didn't I? Thirty percent. Okay. So 30% are hypothyroid. Right, so next question. The inferior parathyroid gland originates from which branchial arch? The fourth, the second, the sixth, or the third? Okay, let's look. Right, I told you this too, a couple of slides. So 72% got it correct, it's a third. Next slide. So after a total thyroglobulin, sorry, after total thyroidectomy, when should you perform a thyroglobulin? So we don't do it preoperatively. Uh, we do it post op as a tumor marker. So, what I'm asking, how long does it take the body to get rid of thyroid 
after total fold x1. Okay. So it's six weeks. Okay, so 60% of you got that correct. Next question. In suspected Graves' disease, which of the following should be requested? Thyroid receptor antibodies, TFTs, an ultrasound scan, or a technician scan. Okay. Let's see. There's more than one. Correct answer. Okay, so, yep, so we want the TRAB receptor antibodies, that's very specific once again for Graves, thyroid function test obviously goes without saying. An ultrasound scan we wouldn't do, we'd do a technician scan, okay, on the basis of the thyroid function test. Okay, next. Inspected viral thyroiditis. The technician scan reveals which of those? De Curvain's thyroiditis. Okay, so in thyroiditis, the gland is sick. It doesn't take up iodine or technician, so there'll be an absence uptake. Next slide. So which of the following in the module are suspicious of cancer? So coarse calcification is incorrect. It's fine, microcalcification. They are taller than wider, so that's incorrect too. Peripheral vascularity is seen more commonly associated with benign rather than malignant, so that's incorrect too. Hyperechogenicity is more likely to be benign than malignant. Defined margins, obviously more likely to be benign. So, um, of course, calcification, that's incorrect. Widen tall is incorrect. Peripheral acid is incorrect. Hyperdigy, incorrect. So, defined margins, incorrect. So, it's really none of the above. You did well there, I thought. What is the annual year upon year increase in thyroid cancer. Seven percent. Thyroid cancer is identified in what percentage of post-mortem thyroids? It's a third, 33%. And last question. Thyroid cancer is diagnosed in what percentage of 5-3-F nodules? Twenty-five percent. Okay, so I think that's the end of the quiz. Um, If anyone wants to ask any questions through the chat uh, facility, uh, please do.
Thank you, Prof. That was a really informative talk. Lots of really precious tips for the FRCS um, and a real key take home message in terms of not over investigating thyroid nodules only appropriately. So our first question, we've had a few. Um, how do we counsel GPs not to ultrasound scan nodules less than a centimetre if there is obviously a concern that some five millimetre nodules may have uh, features of cancer warring, warranting an FNA? What advice? Yeah, we, we, you won't palpate um, a cancer yeah. of five millimetres. That's the first point. Sure. Um, uh, I, I think what we've got to do it, it, it's education and i think the education has to take place at an undergraduate level and that's a huge problem for us as a specialty because ent i, I just can't understand why but it doesn't seem to have emphasis uh and importance at an undergraduate level I, I, god knows what the gmc are doing so uh, if you're producing doctors that have no exposure to ENT and they, they do less ward work now, so it tends to be more book orientated, then that message to all of them is, is going to be difficult. Um, but we just have to, I guess, uh, bang the drum continually at an undergraduate level to our, our medical students, get better exposure. Um, and I, I really can't think of any other way that we're going to be able to get that message home um, because there are only so many GPs you can lecture to. And maybe they're doing mm. for a, because of Tolly's Law. You know, why are you investigating someone? Are you doing it for the patient or are you doing it to protect yourself because you're worried about missing something and be sued? And I understand that, of course. Mm. I, I really get that. Uh, angle too. It's, it's very easy for us to be pious and, and uh, in ivory towers to, to say, well, you shouldn't do this, shouldn't do that. But it's just bad medicine. Okay, great. Thank you. And in terms of treating Graves' disease, how long would you treat them medically before considering surgery? Okay, that, that depends once again, as I said. So if you are treating uh, a patient surgically then they have to be euthyroid so you'd have to get them stable uh, and in a, a a state where you can operate so i mentioned to you so the coexistence of thyroid eye disease is an important factor as part of the you know the treatment options so if they've got really bad thyroid eye disease uh, surgery uh, is the you know often the the option um, because, and if they're male, they often have a, a worse prognosis, and particularly if they smoke. So uh, those patients tend to be referred for surgery earlier. And if you've got a massive uh, thyroid, again, that's not going to settle down on conservative management or with radio ID. They have to have surgery. Mm. So small thyroids, no thyroid eye disease, medical management 12 months, take them off the medication, 50% will be okay, 50% will recur, and then it's a discussion with the patient, depending on their social service and their treatment preference. Great, thank you. Um, these seem to be the only questions you've had so far, actually. I think you've covered such uh, succinct facts and, and great tips um, that people haven't had many questions based on that. Uh,